Hello, you're probably going to see... You're probably going to see me slowly wake up. It's 7 a.m. here. I just got up, uh, made lunch for my kids, and then this is my second cup of coffee. So I think you'll you'll slowly hear the speed and coherency of my speech speed up over time. So um, I've been working on two different projects that I think are kind of the same project. So uh, there's, I think there's very few people that are specialized in the way I'm specialized in. Uh, half of my work is in philosophy of art and aesthetics uh, and the study of various mediums. And the other half is working on things like social epistemology and technology. And I think these go really well together and you're gonna see some of the output of that in today's talk. I think it's because for me, the philosophy of art is really a history of the philosophy of the technology of communication, right? Every single study in aesthetics that's domain specific is a study about how haiku, poetry, film changes the way we record things and changes the way we communicate and express things. Uh, and so for me, a lot of the work I did on say, when I was starting to work on Twitter, I found a lot of material from the side of me that studies like knowledge and testimony, not that useful. And the things I found really useful were older aesthetics work on jokes or haiku or the essential shortness of form. So that's that's some introduction for where I got to where I'm uh, talking about today. So for a while, I've been working on two research streams. One research stream has been about echo chambers and conspiracy theories and trying to understand why the how these things work and how these things are so compelling. And the other part of my life has been about working about games and trying to figure out the appeal of games. So the background thought is in my in the work I did about you know, on games, the central idea, so I'd gotten frustrated with the, with all the stuff I'd seen about games that focused on how games were a kind of narrative or a kind of fiction or a kind of story and ignored a lot of the gamier parts of games. It felt to me like what people were doing was taking theories we already had from fiction and movies and applying them to games. And I was trying to understand how games worked. Um, and I saw this incredible, uh, so I mean, I, 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 I'm... This is a European audience, not an American audience. So I was obsessed with particularly German board games and with the master of German board game design, Reiner Knitia, who's one of my aesthetic heroes. And there's a, I, I see people nodding instead of just giving me blank looks, which is awesome. And there's a talk uh, he gives at a game developer conference where he says, the most important thing in my designer toolkit is the point system because the point system tells people what to care about. It sets their desires in the game. And in one sense, if you play games, it seems totally obvious, right? You open up a game and the game tells you, okay, you're teamed up with these people and you're breeding sheep. And you're like, okay, I want to collect sheep. On the other hand, if you're a philosopher who works like me in moral psychology and practical reasoning, the same thought is mind blowing, right? You're like, oh my God, games tell you what to care about. So my theory of games ended up being centered on this. And the theory came, ended up saying something like, games work in the artistic medium of agency itself. And game designers specify that agency by giving you abilities, but most importantly, by setting your motivation through points. And one of the, the center of the idea for me was part of the pleasure of games was that you got this experience of clarity, that in normal life, things were nauseating overwhelming, um, there's so many values, they're so plural, they're hard to apply. Like how do I trade off the value of my health versus the value of working with my children versus the value of research versus the like all these things. But in games, for once, you get an incredible, exquisitely clear point system. You know exactly how to apply, you know exactly how to commensurate, you know exactly how well you've done. And you get this incredibly potent feeling of total value clarity. At the end of the games book, I ended up worrying about gamification. And a lot of the work I've done since then has been saying things like games are great, but when you gamify ordinary life, when you say add points to something like Twitter or Fitbit or research impact factors or citation rates or, um, uh, or gamified uh, fitness, what you've done is you've offered people a trade where they can get all the motivations, the motivational bonuses of being in a game and having these clear points. And all they have to do is internalize an external point system that's been set by an institution. 
So a different paper, a background paper that this one spun out of called Value Capture, I ended up saying that the problem of this, of taking on these external points in things like Twitter or citation rates was that you were outsourcing your value system, that you uh, were letting someone else set what you cared about and getting a motivational bonus in exchange for aligning your cares with these really clear external points. And so at this point, uh, the work I did on games and the work I did on echo chambers collided because I realized there's an underlying similarity, which is that in both cases, they're offering you this false tailored, deliciously clear clarity, right? Twitter offers you points, you know exactly how you've done. A conspiracy offers you this clear explanation of the entire world that's just crisp. And so the paper you're about to see is my attempt to unify the thinking about point systems and bureaucracies and the appeal of metrics with the talk about conspiracy theories. So they're going to be, so this is, so the talk I'm about to give you is, uh, parts of this are published already um, in the Royal Institute of Philosophy under this name, The Seductions of Clarity. But this is a point to find the underlying similar, similar thread between certain oversimplified bureaucratic language and conspiracy theories um, and prevent a kind of like unified theory of fake clarity. So that's, that's where we're going. Um, all right, that was the introduction. That took forever. Um, right, I already said that. Okay, I, I said all this. There were slides for what I just told you and I totally forgot because it's seven in the morning. Okay, so here's the question. Is there a general phenomenon that unites, for me, work metrics and conspiracy theories about different systems that are engineered for the feelings of clarity, right? It's not just the oversimplification of value. Um, so, so here's the general theme. I'm, here's the general idea from the talk. I'm going to claim that the feeling of clarity, and I, I mean here the feeling. I don't mean whatever Descartes said when he said, when you're clear, you grasp the idea. I mean the phenomenon, the, what it feels like to be clear, that the feeling of clarity plays a role in cognitive resource management, that we're limited beings and we have limited time and attention. And one of the things we use to figure out where to attend is this feeling of clarity. I'm going to suggest that the feeling of clarity tells us not to investigate further and a feeling of confusion tells us to investigate further, that that's a kind of heuristic we use to steer our limited time, right? Um, and I'm going to propose that, and this is going to be based on some empirical studies, uh, not that I've done, but I'm referring to, that we use the feeling of clarity as a heuristic for terminating thought, as a rough guide for one to stop thinking. And so hostile and manipulative forces will try to manipulate that feeling of clarity and imbue systems with the feeling of clarity to get us to terminate our investigations and simply accept them. And again, the two major case studies are going to be in bureau bureaucratized metrics and conspiracy theories. So if this talk is titled, why do people believe in weird things? One of those weird things is going to be um, uh, conspiracy theories in QAnon and the others. I don't know what the term for it is where you teach, but for us, it's educational learning outcomes. This is the, this is the idea that there are clear, simple quantitative measures of educational success that can be applied universally across a, uni uh, a university. By the way, I, if, if, if it, it's not clear, half of this work is coming um, I'm giving my, I was in charge of doing the quantified learning assessment of the success we had in educating our students in critical thinking. I was in charge of that for six years. And this talk is in part my therapy for like the hideous awfulness I was involved in and imposed on our students. Um, this is confession. So, um, so a lot of the work I've been doing in this space on echo chambers, I've been needing a name for it to, clar to clarify why I think the approach is a little bit different. And here's the name I finally have. I'm calling it hostile epistemology. Hostile epistemology studies the strategies of epistemic manipulators. And this is very different from another kind of popular approach to echo chamber uh, work on echo chambers and conspiracy theories, which is vice epistemology. So vice epistemology, I think typically focuses on the bad qualities of the believer. And I think that's one, that's, that's one approach, but it typically starts by asking, what is bad about the person that believes in the conspiracy theories? And I wanna focus on the strategies of people that are trying to manipulate others, because I think this might reveal that there are many cases in which the believers aren't entirely at fault, but have standard and understandable vulnerabilities and epistemic faults from being a cognitively limited agent that, external manipulators can take advantage of. 
In particular, what I'm going to suggest is that there are a broad range of strategies that any rational being that's cognitively li limited, that has incredibly short resources and small amounts of time, has to employ to be a cognitively limited being in an overwhelming world, and that those can be exploited by certain techniques. Right. Um, so I want to say that hostile epistemology does not assume hostile intent. Um, think about the term hostile environment, right? So we say that Mars is a hostile environment to humans. That has nothing to do with intention. That just has to do with its relationship to our capacities and abilities. And I think hostility is really relevant to purposes and capacities. So the deep ocean floor is not hostile to certain kinds of fish, but hostile to humans. And uh, I discovered at the beginning of the pandemic that 10 minutes walk away from my house was this incredibly good French bakery that made extraordinarily good croissants. And I would say this was actually very conducive to my efforts to be a uh, happy, aesthetically motivated culinary being and very hostile to my efforts to not like die of sugar overdose, right? So, um, so I think there are two kinds of hostile epistemology, at least loosely. One is cognitive seduction, which is the manipulation of positive epistemic signals, like the pleasures of understanding. And the other, other is the cognitive intimidation, the manipulation of negative epistemic uh, signs like discomfort and confusion. I'm going to focus on the former uh, just because that's what I'm doing here. But I should note, I've had some conversations with other people that work in conspiracy theories and cults. And one of the things I've noticed, we've noticed, is that earlier cults, in real space, like 70s and 80s cults, often work on a kind of intimidation and breaking down people's self-beliefs. And new, the new stuff, the stuff that flourishes on like Reddit and on like Breitbart forums seems to work through seduction. And I think there's something, my guess is that the inability, like a lot of old school cults worked, required the ability to physically isolate people from their peers for a while. And I, I suspect that the new school online stuff doesn't have the capacity, so it's chase strategy. So it's just a completely wild seat in my pants empirical guess, but that's, that's, that's my guess. Um, part of this happens because I think a bunch of people who are friends of mine who worked in this, this space themselves grew up in some kind of cult and left, and they talk about how the cults they were involved in in like the 80s had a very different feel from what they're looking at online right now. And it does involve, you're going to come to the compound, and then we're going to yell at you for it. Okay, anyway. okay, so the general theme with a lot of the stuff I've been doing here is that a lot of people seem to want to say in this post-truth era, whatever the hell you want to call it, people are losing interest in the truth, they're becoming lazy. And I think First of all, it doesn't look like that to me. If it, you look at, say, people in QAnon, what it looks like is people trying very, very hard to be rational in many ways, doing really intense work. And I'm particularly interested in the possibility that good faith rational efforts are being subverted by the manipulation of or the evolution of social or technological background conditions that take advantage of our vulnerability. So here's the question. How would hostile forces manipulate clarity to get us to accept a thought? So my methodology to start is going to be to imagine a hostile manipulator. By the way, I'm totally stealing this from Descartes. Uh, I'm, again, not uh, presuming that hostility is always intentional. But I think if we imagine, if we do a kind of construction thought experiment about how an intentional manipulator would make things, we can get a view of what kind of environments would be functionally hostile. And then we can see those environments out there um, even when they're not intentionally made. I think in a lot of cases, they kind of like accidentally evolve for various reasons. Like somebody figures out they can make more money mysteriously if they set up their social media company in a certain way. Um, and the main idea is gonna follow heavily from William Wimsatt's incredible book, Reengineering Philosophy for Limited Beings, Piecewise Approximations of Reality, which is an amazing title. This is a kind of like cult classic philosophy of science work. Um, and Wimsatt's idea, is that in practical reasoning for limited beings, the primary load is the need to manage cognitive resources. Almost everything we do strategically is about managing cognitive resources because there's way too much for us to know and too little time to think about it. By the way, uh, for the philosophers and epistemologists in the room, Wimsatt's work is relatively early. He's been doing, he's doing this work in the 80s and 90s. And I think one of the reasons he's onto this earlier than the rest of philosophers are is he's not in philosophy of science. He's in, sorry, he's not in epistemology. He's in philosophy of science. If people studying how real world knowledge works in scientific communities constantly have to deal with information overload, right? They constantly have to deal with no scientists being able to keep track of more than a tenth of a percent of the amount of scientific knowledge that they're actually using. So one familiar research management technique 
that's been really well studied in parts of practical theory of practical reasoning is intentions and resolutions. So Bratman and Holton say that intentions and resolutions are way are techniques. Forming a resolution is a technique to settle the mind against most oncoming consideration to create cognitive inertia, right? So you decide on something and you close your mind to reconsideration to some degree, not completely, but uh, defeasibly. Why would you want to do this? And the answer is to endless to avoid the endless drain of cognitive resources. So one of the Bratman standard examples is it's morning. My wife and I decide. I mean, this is actually true. We uh, we delayed our anniversary dinner from a few weeks ago because we had COVID, and so we're gonna. We decided this morning where to go for our wedding ma marriage anniversary dinner, and. We have decided, and we're not going to keep reopening the question. I'm not going to let strange appetite whims that pass through me reopen the question. I'm not going to right, like look at my bank book during the day to see if I can afford the, the, the meal we've decided on. And I think the reason is because if we didn't settle our mind, we would be thinking too constantly about too much stuff. right? We need to close one line of inquiry so we can open other lines of inquiry. We need to leave them closed so we don't have to reopen them at the time when anything relevant occurs. Like maybe if I get a stomach flu or my car explodes, we have to reconsider what we're going to do for dinner. But most normal circumstances don't change things. So here's what this shows us. The interesting thing I think this reveals is that we have various methods for containing inquiry without reopening inquiry. And they have to be estimations. So one thing we need to do as cognitively limited beings is we need to know when to stop in an epistemic investigation. We need to know when to stop thinking, right? Because we don't have enough resources. But because we're limited beings, we can't conclude every line of investigation. We can't say we're going to think things through until we have a conclusion, right? Because there are too many things to think about. I actually think um, if, you want a, if you want the look of certain kinds of people that don't ever try to ep uh, end epistemic investigation on anything, think about certain philosophers you may know who are practically useless. And the reason is all questions are open, never terminate inquiry, can't decide where to go to dinner. So we need, does this make sense? This is, this is kind of the key idea of this talk. We need a heuristic to figure out when we've investigated enough. We need a rough guess where we figure out that we can terminate a line of inquiry without taking that line of inquiry to the end because we can't take every line of inquiry to the end. So in, interestingly to me, in over in philosophy and practical reasoning, almost nothing has been written about this. The only thing I've seen is this wonderful paper from Justin Dahlman called When Obstinacy is a Better Cognitive Policy, in which he persuades, a, to me, a really, and he offers a really plausible account where he says the right theory is a Q theory of resource management. So he thinks that as we come in, as information comes in to think about, we make a rough guess label of its priority and we create a priority queue, which means of course, as everyone knows, in an overwhelming life, things with low priority, you just don't do, right? I, I speak as a parent whose house is accumulating piles of rubbish in the corners because it's not as important as keeping the children alive right now. Um, and I'm, so, uh, so, I mean, I'm, I, I'm partial to this theory. I'm not gonna use that precise theory, but in general, I think, he gives a really good simpatico account of why we need these resource management strategies. So what I've said so far, this claim, the claim for the heuristic, that's from, in my mind, kind of pure philosophy. That comes out of just an, analyzing our state as cognitive resource limit, uh, as cognitively limited beings. So now I'm gonna make a contingent empirical non-necessary claim about the nature the particular nature of that heuristic. And of course that heuristic could change. Like we change, we change the heuristics we use all the time. So I'm gonna propose that for many of us, we use heuristics in the following way. And this proposal is partially empirically supported. So I think this proposal is gonna be in line with, I'll, I'll mention some of the sources, but sociological anthropological work on both conspiracy theories and bureaucratic metrics. I think this will fit with that empirical work but this has not been studied in psych and cognitive psych. Uh, as far as I can tell, people aren't studying this very much. And uh, I don't know who's in the room, but this is an open invitation for people to study this. And there's at least one psychologist in Switzerland who's taken up my proposal enough to make a grant proposal to study some of this stuff. But this has not been studied in psych very well. Um, 
So here's the proposal. We use a sense of confusion as a heuristic for continuing investigations, and we use a sense of clarity as a heuristic for ending investigations. This is in some sense, this proposal comes in part just from hanging out on conspiracy theoretic forums and seeing how people behave. Um, so I'm gonna use the term clarity uh, to indicate the phenomena associated with understanding. The phenomena here means the internal phenomena, the mental feel of having an understanding. So here's the big worry. If clarity is a thought terminating heuristic, there's a serious cognitive vulnerability. So if someone can package a system of beliefs with that thought terminating signal, if they can make it feel clear, they can, they can get us to accept it and not inquire about it. So I think of this as something like the manipulation of attention. So the thought terminating heuristic could serve as something like a cognitive invisibility quote, right? So John Le Carre, one of my favorite genre writers, is, was a spy novelist who wrote realistic spy thrillers because he had actually been part of British intelligence. And he has this marvelous description of his, his main character, George Smiley, who's the opposite of James Bond. George Smiley's not handsome. George Smiley is not, uh, not dashing. George Smiley does not move with physical grace. He is described as like the most bland and boring person possible. And Lakare comments at some point in one of his books that the best spy is too boring and normal to people, for people to even begin paying attention to. That's a way to disappear. And I'm going to suggest, so there, there's also a thing, if you study stage magic, one of the things stage magicians do is if they want to do a manipulation in this hand, they learn to make this hand look really boring and quiet and to throw attention to this other very vibrant hand that's actually not doing anything important. And my suggestion is going to be that you can control, use these two heuristics together. The sense of confusion sends people attention somewhere else and the sense of clarity drives their attention away. All right. Um, again, now we're in kind of empirical synthetic space where I'm, as a philosopher, synthesizing empirical work. So, uh, so this might seem like common sense. Of course, people like oversimplifications, but the picture I'm going to offer doesn't place the blame primarily on the brute irrationality of the believer themselves. The picture is going to be the normally useful epistemic heuristics, in fact, heuristics that we have to have in place because we're limited beings are being gamed intentionally and consciously often by hostile sources. So there's a test run. So there is some nearby empirical work that doesn't exactly show my point, but, but it's compatible about processing fluency. So one thing we know is that people use, this is actually quite well studied in COGSI, people use the feeling of being able to quickly process as a shortcut to acceptance. So basically a lot of results show the easy, so they're, they're a lot, the easier it is for you to think a thought, the more likely you are to accept it. And this seems like a useful heuristic because a lot of the times being able to think a thought easily uh, and go through a line of argument easily uh, is, a roughly is roughly correlated with your experience in the terrain. But of course this can be gamed. So one, some of the COGSI work in this space shows, for example, that your likelihood of accepting something is highly uh, dependent on the readability of the font. If the font makes it hard to read, you're less likely to accept it. If the font makes it easier to read, then you're more likely to accept it. And of course this can be gamed. So um, the familiarity of slogans, having heard something many times, one of the explanations in COGSI is that process, it's, it's triggering the processing fluency heuristic and making you uh, more likely to accept it. But uh, sorry, this slide, if you want, I'll send you the citations for this stuff. This is, um, this is in the Kahn Kahneman, Tversky, cognitive biases literature. Um, so here's my question. How might we trigger this to create the exaggerated feeling of understanding? If you wanted to imbue a belief system with that feeling that would trigger that heuristic, how would you do it? So here's a first pass. Alison Gopnik, famously in the paper, Explanation is Orgasm, suggests there's a phenomenal feel to the moment of grasping an explanation, a pleasurable aha moment. And I think that's right, but I think that can't capture the whole story because that's just a one moment in the life cycle of understanding. It's about the moment when you understand. But I really understand what it's like to think you have understood because I think for, especially for conspiracy theories, there's an aha moment, but there's also this, the, the life you lead for years afterwards being in that system, right? So 
for a deeper pass. So what I want to talk about is what it feels like to understand what the phenomena is. So I think the, the way to get there is to think about what understanding actually is. So here I'm going to draw on this rich literature from philosophy of science and philosophy of education, about the difference between understanding and knowledge. This is people like Catherine Elgin, John Fonvig, uh, Stephen Grimm, Michael Strebens, and more. And if you don't know this literature, the, this is a philosophical literature that's trying to push people from the idea that the goal of us as rational beings is to know things to the idea that it's to understand things. So that might seem like semantic, blah, but basically the model is knowledge tends to be focused, at least for the way philosophers have talked about it, knowledge tends to be focused on individual discrete propositions. Do you know this claim or not? And understanding is a holistic notion aimed at a whole system, right? You understand biology or you understand medicine. So the general view from this literature is that understanding differs from mere pointless knowledge because it involves grasping a whole structure and not just individual nodes. And then it involves having an internal model that can be used to explain the particulars. So one of the, um, <clears throat> one of the primary ideas is something like in science, when you understand, you just don't just know particular things, you have a model of how a process works that you can use to explain new phenomenon that integrates the various explanations. And the, this new view from this space is that understanding is the real target of inquiry. That's what we're doing, especially in science. So what is it to come to understand? Catherine Elgin says that in the moment of understanding, what it feels like is systems of categories shift to accommodate new information. And John Kvanweg says, you suddenly grasp a coherence relationship and see how distant unrelated nodes actually fit. So let's call this the phenomenon of cognitive epiphany. So that's the moment. That's an expansion of the Gopnik thought. The next thing is the phenomenon of having an understanding, having it already loaded in your system. What's that like? Here's a great thing, a quote from John Conway. Um, it is to have mastered such explanatory relationships is valuable, not only because it involves finding of new truths, because uh, finding such relationships organizes and systematizes our thinking on a subject matter in a way beyond the mere addition of more true beliefs or even justified true belief. Such organization is pragmatically useful because it allows us to reason from one bit of information to another related information that is useful as a basis for inference. Moreover, such organized elements of thought provide intrinsically satisfying closure to the process of inquiry, yielding a sense or feeling of completeness to our grasp of a particular subject matter. Let's call this cognitive facility. This is the ability you have once you understand. So to summarize, Kvan Fink said, the facility with the terrain is the capacity to move between nodes and see connections and the capacity to accommodate new information. And Michael Strevens adds, if you have understanding, one criteria is you can communicate that understanding. If I have a model, I can give you the model and you can use the model too, right? So let's be hostile epistemic manipulators, let's be evil. So we wanna create a system that triggers this feeling to get people to stop thinking. Then we'll need to create a system that maximizes the feel of ideas sliding into place, maximizes the feel of seeing connections, maximizes the capacity to generate some kind of explanation and maximizes the sense of communicability. Um, and I, just to be clear, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about it. I think conspiracy theories are an obvious candidate here. Right, this is what conspiracy theories do. They offer you this powerful explanation that suddenly fits everything. You need to explain all kinds of new stuff, right? You can pass it to other people. I'm actually not gonna talk about conspiracy theories a lot here because I think it's so obvious that they do that and that the way they work is by maximizing these feelings. Suddenly everything fits and you can explain everything in one. I'm gonna spend more time on the bureaucracy side just because I think that's a little odder. Um, so, it might, be, it might seem really hard to do this, but here's an advantage we evil manipulators have. People who are after genuine understanding are constrained by epistemic considerations. They have to get it right. We manipulators don't. We're free to maximize the feeling of understanding because we don't have to um, match our system to the truth. Footnote, citation, this argument is borrowed from my mother. My mother used to tell me that it was easy for fast food restaurants to make food delicious because fast food restaurants didn't care about making food healthy, where she had to make food healthy so she'd never make it as delicious. That's the suggestion, right? And I keep, this analogy is going to keep coming up where I think a lot of the stuff, it's kind of like cognitive sugar, right? That there's a stuff that is in the environment of our evolutionary adaptiveness might have been a useful signal, but now various interests have figured out that they can manipulate us by loading things with that system. And yeah. So here's a potential weakness. People will change the heuristic 
if they notice that it makes errors. That's how we work as rational beings. If the heuristic makes errors, we adapt the heuristic. So the system needs to mask errors. And I think often, at least in the conspiracy theories I study, they, it comes by making the core claims in non-testable areas, like embedding scientific claims in moral claims. So if the manipulator can get their system in first and trigger the stop investigation mechanism, then that's a handy tool for getting people not to see the flaws in that system. So again, obviously echo chambers with conspiracy theories. Hopefully it's clear that conspiracy theories do this. So I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about the other case that I think is less obvious, um, which is uh, educational assessment and other bureaucratic metrics like citation rates, H index. I, every time I give this talk in England, there's something called your ref score there that seems to dominate academic life that I wanna talk about completely. So uh, a lot of this work comes from, by the way, so I'm gonna talk about a little bit of empirical work uh, in history sociology and to the philosophers in the room, a lot of this seem will, will seem really familiar and interesting to you, but like in terms you know, and it's because this is a large empirical space, uh, sorry, space in the empirical side of the humanities um, that spins off of philosophical work. So these are historians and anthropologists that are really influenced in particular by Ian Hacking and Bruno Latour. So this stuff will seem really, really familiar, but I think it's worth reading if you, it's very empirically rich and I think it deepens the pictures from Hacking and Latour. So Porter and Trust in Numbers, which is one of the works that, books that kicks off this. Porter is a historian, um, and he's studying the rise of quantification culture in bureaucracies and politics. He thinks that um, the core picture is that there, he thinks there are two kinds of knowledge, quantitative knowledge and qualitative knowledge. And he thinks both are good in their context, but we are now over relying on quantitative knowledge in inappropriate contexts. And his theory is that qualitative knowledge is rich, nuanced, and context sensitive, but travels poorly between people from different contexts. A long written evaluation of my student, another philosopher might understand, but the dean of the business school is not going to understand. Quantitative knowledge, that is, in, so he's not talking about quantitative uh, quantification in the abstract, but specifically in institutional contexts, um, tries to get around that problem by identifying invariant kernels shaving off all the nuance and having people collect data on the invariant kernels. So it travels easily between contexts and is aggregatable. So here I think in terms of numerical grades and letter grades, right? Those are very simple. Those are, remo they remove a lot of nuance. They just study one dimension, but because everyone is using the same dimension and offering the same simple ranking on a spectrum that travels easily between contexts and aggregates easily. Um, and Scott, I think there's a work a lot of you probably know, Scott in Seeing Like a State says that large scale organizations like corporations and governments need information put in some kind of standard and ag aggregatable format so that central management can bring that organization and the world into view. Um, yeah, I talked about GPA already. So, so here, think about something like, so in my university, this was called an educational learning outcome. So the way this works is uh, the university has certain desired educational learning outcomes that are names, and there's a current reporting on how well the university is doing. And each department has to report how its students are supporting those educational learning outcomes by connecting those ELOs to certain rubrics. And what happens is if you show that the educational learning outcomes from your class match the educational learning outcomes from the department and that those match the university, then this amazing thing happens where you enter these numbers into a spreadsheet of what your class did, and it changes instantly changes the reporting of how well your department is doing and instantly changes the reporting of how well the university is doing it instantly changes an internal measure of how well the department is department is supporting the university measures right so a lot of these learning outcomes i'm sure you know terms like this are like in abilities to synthesize in uh, increases statistical knowledge increases uh reading capacity in, right things like that um so notice that this gives us a sense of cognitive facility. So we can immediately produce justifications that are comprehensible to people. We can see connections between the layers. I can immediately see how what I do in my class supports the, what the department says it's doing and what the university says it's doing. And we can be sure that we're understood. So one of the interesting things I found working in the bureaucracy was when I tried to explain why my class or our department was doing something in a way, in a language that was specific to philosophy, I would get blank looks. But if you use the language of the educational learning outcomes specifically, if you're like, okay, we are producing 
student engagement and better civic virtue. Those are terms that are comprehended. Everyone says, oh yeah, okay, right, great, right? So my suggestion is kind of that in this case, we create the feeling of understanding, in this case of understanding of justifications for action, right? By creating a standardized language of justification and a standardized methodology of offering justifications in that language. And that creates the feelings of understanding, even though it might not actually have genuine understanding. Um, and I want to particularly emphasize about this case, the creation of a regular vocabulary that everyone shares, even if they don't understand it. One of the funnier things is the core mission statement of my last university was student engagement. When you ask if you can justify things in terms of student engagement, people will give you money. But if you ask people what student engagement is, no one knows. That's in, um, that if you have the capacity to know that you can reach for a term and know that people will then give you money or approve your classes. This creates the feeling of cognitive facility by at least simulating the feeling that you're being communicated and being understood, especially when those communications are easily reliable or even automatically actionable. So the claim here isn't the quantification is bad, by the way, the bureaucracy is useless. It's that the systems of standardization required for bureaucratic functioning create a typical danger of seductive clarity. So here's a worry. Larger worry. That's by the way, we've gotten through the main material from the talks. So I just want to make some larger points before I end. I have a larger worry that when we accept cat categorizations in these simplified systems, we may lose sensitivity to things that don't occur in those categorizations. This is not something I've argued for. This is kind of like the thing that I want to understand in the large scale. My my worry is that there's something that's happening where the easy usability of simplified categorization systems capture people's attention and make them not see things that are outside those categorizations. Um, and in particular, that seductive clarity here trades away openness and sensitivity to novelty and detail in exchange for the capacity to quickly offer explicit justifications. Um, there's a thought in the background. This is the thought I've been working on for a while. So the big thought that this is this not this paper, a paper I'm trying to write. I really just thinking about things like mission statements and education and learning outcomes makes me worry that there's something about core values, about values and things like education that just won't admit of extreme explicit expl explication. That there's something, a tension here between complete explicability and loyalty to a kind of true value. So I, I'm trying to explain what that is. And one of the explanations I'm flirting with is that true, like genuine values have this kind of, kind of organic dynamism that can't be captured by explicit systems. And the other explanation is something like open-endedness in your value lets your attention be more curious at the edges. But when you explicate the edges of that value, that closes down that curiosity, right? And that's, of course, really related to the things I'm talking about today. So what's the alternative? So Elizabeth Camp, um, what's it alternative to clear systems of evaluation? Elizabeth Camp has this wonderful work on metaphors. She says metaphors are great because they are purposefully unclear. They're a rough gesture at the world saying this thing is something like that thing, but is open about the fact that it's not sure exactly what that is. So I think metaphors anti-trigger the seductiveness of clarity. They, they carry with them clearly a reminder of their confusingness. So speech that wears on its face its unclarity indicates the need for further investigation. And speech that implicates a finalized system behind it closes off further investigation. So speech, you might think that encourages sensitivity would indicate its non-finality. And that's something that poets have over philosophers. Maybe. Okay, last thought. How do we fight seductive clarity? At an individual level, you can cultivate a counter heuristic. So here's a counter heuristic I've developed in my life. So, and I think this is basic evolutionary psychology stuff that I'm sure a lot of you know, but I think a lot of us have a limitless capacity for fat and sugar and salt because in the environment of evolutionary adaptiveness, you couldn't get too much of that stuff. But now we're in a different environment where, where hostile agents are making junk food for their profit. Um, and I think the counter heuristic that I've learned to uh, develop personally is to become suspicious when things are too yummy. What it looks like is I eat a chip and I'm like, oh my God, that's great. And I immediately just need to pick up the package and say, what the hell is in this bag? Is this going to kill off and it's going to kill me, right? Um, 
So uh, I think the equivalent, the cognitive equivalent is something like, if an idea is too tasty and yummy, you have to immediately become suspicious. When you are aware that the environment is trying to make seductively clear thoughts that's full of actors that have mastered this, right? That there is a sc schools, institutions, I mean, we, we call it propaganda, but like <clears throat> institutions that have increasingly developed their skill at generating seductively clear techniques, then the, when you hear an idea, and I hate this, but I think this is what we have to do. When you hear an idea that seems really satisfying and really explanatory and really great, you immediately have to become suspicious. I hate living like this, but I genuinely think that especially those of us that navigate, I mean, this is, I think this is now my reaction to like memes on Facebook, right? Like I want to, it involves a certain degree of alienation from certain of your pleasure impulses, which I think is terrible, but also again, in an environment where we know that we're filled with people that get power by manipulating our pleasure impulses, we have to become suspicious. It's a terrible way to be. Okay, here's the big picture. If you wanna hook up a lot of the papers I've been working on. So the carrot, there's a pleasure side. So in how Twitter gamifies communication, I've suggested that Twitter offers us a trade where we take on simplified goals of popularity in exchange for greater pleasure. That it's more painful to be attached to your more subtle, varied, no, uh, uh, communicative goals. And in moral outrage porn, Becca Williams and I suggested that there are certain simplified moral systems that we adopted because there was a pleasure in simplified, clear moral reactions. Um, so those are the pleasure side. And then this, the invisibility cloak is that you can hide complexity and difficulty underneath a cloak of apparent clarity. So you put that together, here's the strategy you get. You draw attention with systems that offer pleasure in exchange for adopting and promulgating simplified belief, and you hide the real movement with the seductive clarity uh, in the active hand. This is a really rough metaphor, um, but in the bigger picture is that in these value capture places, uh, cases I've been worried about, I'm really interested in cases where your subtle personal values get swamped by institutional presentations of clear and quantified values like Twitter likes and GPA and college ranking and money. And the worry is that seductive clarity can get you to stop deliberating about your values by presenting you with an apparently understood seductively clear presentation of an evaluative system. That's it, thanks.